Revelation chapter 3, we're going to finish off part 2 of this church at Laodicea. And as I said in the church earlier, you'll see chapter 4 verse 1, it pivots to a completely different direction. Because Revelation 4 is ending this historical letters to historical churches and pivoting into the future because... It says at the end of verse 1 of Revelation 4, Revelation 4 verse 1, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So immediately you've got a clue that from chapter 4 onwards we're entering a future period to John. Okay? And most people believe it's future even to us. Okay? When you get to chapter 6 of Revelation, you're hitting the Great Tribulation period, the era. All right? And then that will go from Revelation 6 all the way to Revelation 19. And then at Revelation 20, you have the millennium, the thousand years, when Satan is bound for a thousand years on the earth. And then at the end of the millennium, Revelation 20, you have that great battle of Gog and Magog. And then the great judgment day when the dead, small and great, Revelation 20 verse 12, stand before God. And then Revelation 21 and 22 is what we call the eternal golden age. Maybe I should write this up just to make it simple. You have Revelation 1 to 3 is one section. These are historical letters to churches at 95 AD, around 95 AD. Then in chapter 4, to chapter 19, we have what we call the Great Tribulation period. How long is the Great Tribulation period? At least seven years. That's the right answer. Not seven years, because it might be more than seven years. But it certainly includes seven years. Okay? So, seven years, at least. And then Revelation 20, how many years does Revelation 20 cover? 1,000 years. The millennium. And then Revelation 21 to 22 is the eternal golden age, which goes out into eternity. Okay? Eternity future. Now that's a concept we can't really understand. Because we live in time, we're controlled by time and space and matter. Uh, Those forces restrict even our ability to think in terms of eternity. So those, this is how the book of Revelation, most people will divide it this way. Okay? And we'll generally follow that pattern all the way through. And occasionally I will tell you where there's a difference of opinion in interpretation. But, and of course, from here onwards is all future to John, the apostle, when he receives his visions on the Isle of Patmos. Okay? I hope that makes it clear. Now, there are people who believe that these seven letters that we're going to finish off today refer to the whole of the church age from AD 96 to the last church on earth. Okay, and they say that each of those seven churches, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, refers to a different age in church history. And they have clever arguments how they apply those things, and you can study that at your own leisure. So, for instance, if you go to Revelation chapter 1, the first church is Ephesus. Okay? Ephesus was a church that was hardworking, that was uh, fundamental in its beliefs and its orthodoxy, but had lost its first love. And they say that was the dominant characteristic of the early church after the Apostle John, from AD 96 to about AD 2300, or sorry, AD 150, AD 200. And then after Ephesus was this church called Smyrna, wasn't it? After Ephesus, Smyrna. And that was the suffering church. Remember Smyrna? 
And they say that's the period when Nero was the emperor and Diocletian was the emperor and all the Christians suffered for their faith. That was the Smyrna this period of church history. And then after Smyrna, you have Pergamos. Pergamos was a compromised church. And you, begot, you started to get that when Constantine brought in the church and the state, merged it together. Okay, And then after Pergamos came this church at Thyatira, where it had that woman Jezebel. And they say that's the rise of the Church of Rome, a woman a female force within the church because they even call it Mother Church, don't they? The Church of Rome. So th this is how they would interpret that. And then they go right through, I won't take time to go through it all, to Laodicea, and they believe that Laodicea reflects the church today. And generally the mood in Christianity is of self-sufficiency, pride, uh, health and wealth, prosperity, and limited persecution. Okay? And that's how they would interpret those seven churches. I don't particularly buy into that. I understand their reasoning. And the reason I don't buy into it is it doesn't really fit very well. For, so, for example, there are more Christians killed today than ever before. Most people don't realize that. It's more dangerous to be a Christian on this earth than ever before. Okay? There's far more Christians murdered today for their faith than at any other time really in world history. Also, Laodicea-type churches have always existed. There's always been churches that are self-sufficient, proud, boastful, <coughs> down through the years. And you can, you can see all these other characteristics in different periods in church history. In fact, I believe you'll see all seven at any one time in church history. Okay? If you just analyze it very carefully. So... If I just take one example, let, let's just take one example. The Reformation, 16th century. The Reformation began in a blaze of glory. Very quickly, the Reformation churches, the Lutheran churches, churches of Calvin in Geneva, John Knox in Scotland, they began to lose their first love, like the church at Ephesus. They were orthodox, but they lost their fervency for the Lord. And very quickly, God began to chastise those churches. The Church of Scotland ended up with a split, and the, what's called the Free Church of Scotland came out of it. The Lutheran churches today is totally apostate, totally ecumenical, signed agreements with the Roman Catholic Church to unite together around many common beliefs. So even in the Reformation, you had churches that would not have fulfilled any of those seven characteristics. But you can slow, slowly see how many of them came like those churches, of the seven churches. So that's why I don't buy into the idea that there are seven dominant type ages within church history. Now, if you want to believe it, it's up to you. Uh, you'll certainly find commentators that teach that as a viewpoint. As I say, it doesn't really persuade me because... I always feel that once you're trying to teach a theory that doesn't fit and you're always having to make exceptions to the theory, you're better off throwing the theory out, aren't you? When you have multiple exceptions. And old Michael Barrett used to be now the professor at the Reform Seminary, at Puritan Reform Seminary. He always used to have this statement, speculation never adds to certainty. And I think there's a lot of truth in that doesn't help people's confidence in God's word when you make these speculations and especially when they don't fit a lot of the evidence you have to force them into uh, these situations to try and prove something that's really not so obvious now let's read this section Revelation 3 let's read from verse 14 again remember this is I believe the longest of the letters or certainly one of the longest letters to this church at Laodicea. And I think I could put it like this. In the West and in Singapore, this church at Laodicea fits better the characteristics of the spirit in most of what calls itself Christianity in America, Europe, and here in Singapore. So I, I, I would concede that, okay? The Laodicea spirit is certainly much more prevalent here 
than the other six churches that we looked at uh, preceding Laodicea. And I'll explain that when we look at this church. So let's read verse 14 to the end responsively. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. But because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now we looked at the first part of this last week, and we saw that this was a very strong message the Lord Jesus Christ gave to this church. It was a very fierce rebuke. He had nothing positive to say, because there was nothing positive he could see to say about this church. And we looked at all of the various condemnations that he gave them. He says, I know your works. Thou art neither cold nor hot, but you're lukewarm. In other words, you're apathetic. You're neither righteous or unrighteous. You're trying to have it both ways as a church. You're proud. I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. You think you don't need anybody. You think that you can run your lives by yourselves. Because you have material possessions, you assume that because money buys so much, it can buy everything. And Christ says, no, no, no. You're not rich, you're actually poor. And that word poor, I mentioned last week, means destitute. It doesn't mean just not wealthy, it means someone who has absolutely nothing, spiritually speaking. You're blind and you're naked. Now, I pointed out that the poor is linked to the fact that they were a very rich place, materially, but poor spiritually. Blind, you'll see now when it talks about the eye salve, is linked to the medicine that was very popular in the city of Laodicea that they sold that cured eye ailments around the Roman Empire. And Raymond, because they were very famous for their designer clothes in Laodicea. They were very famous of their particular materials that they made there and the dye that they used. It was a place that was known for its uh, clothing industry. So all these little statements by the Lord Jesus Christ tells them, I know all about your city, I know all about you, I know all about your lives, I know what's happening in your church, I know what the people in your environment or the world around you are like, I know what Laodicean people are like, I know the thinking of Laodicean people, I know everything about them. And he's saying the same to us. Because remember at the end of this verse, end of this chapter, it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Any, any Christian in any age... Listen to this message because it applies to you. So what's he saying to us? He's saying, I know Singapore. That's what God's saying. I know Cornerstone Church in Singapore. I know every member of Cornerstone Church in Singapore. I know their life in the church and their life in the home and their life in the workplace. I know all about them. I know the temptations. I know the type of people that they have to mingle with every day. I know all about their situation. And I'm aware of it, and I'm watching it, and I'm concerned about it. Now, having said all of that, the Lord Jesus Christ begins verse 18 with these words, I counsel thee. Now, most of us probably would have begun with, I discipline you, or I'm finished with you. That's how most of us would deal with people like the Laodiceans. But God is a God of grace and forgiveness 
as well as a God of wrath. And he doesn't just tell people they're wrong, he tells them how they can become right from the wrong. That's a good lesson, isn't it? There are a lot of parents who just tell their children that they're wrong. Tell them what they're doing wrong. But never guide them into how they should live the right way. How they should handle the situation. There are a lot of employers and bosses in the workplace that always spend their time pointing out the faults in people. Well, it's not wrong to point out the faults, but it is wrong not to show them the way to do it right, isn't it? And here the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a very good model of a balance. Yes, by all means, show them that they're wrong. But please show them the way that they can get right. Always show them the hope. If you diagnose the disease, imagine you go to the doctor and the doctor always tells you, you've got this disease, you've got this disease, uh, now pay the money on the way out for the consultation. Thank you very much. You say, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Give me something. I, I, need a me I need some medicine to cure the problem. Don't just diagnose the problem. Give me something to cure the problem. And Jesus Christ is going to give this church the cure in this council. He doesn't cut them off. He could have cut them off. He could have just said, this church is finished. I'm finished with this Laodicean church. It's so proud. It's so self-righteous. It doesn't even acknowledge me. It thinks it's self-sufficient. I'm not even allowed in the church. They keep me out of their lives. Remember, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. In other words, I'm outside this church. Metaphorically, because he was inside the church in terms that he could see what was going on, of course. But in terms of the way they viewed Christ, Christ was shut off from them as if he was outside the door of their church. Not welcome, not wanted, not needed. And he says, I'm knocking the door. And you know, when someone knocks the door, what do they want? To come in, don't they? The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want to destroy this church. He wants to save this church. He wants to heal this church. And you know, he's doing the same here in your family's life, in your life. When you drift from him, he wants you to be better. God's on your side. He's not your enemy as a Christian. He wants you to have a closer walk with him. He wants you to be closer to him and with him. Now, what's his counsel to this church at Laodicea? He says, be zealous, therefore, and Repent. Well, actually, I should read verse 18 first. I counsel thee to buy of me, he says, gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. So there's the first thing he says. Where's my middle marker? He says, the first thing I want you to do Well, let's list it this way, just to get the order right. Repent. Because in verse 19, at the end of it, it says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This is the key to opening up these things. And then the second one is gold. Now, the word repent is a word that's often misunderstood. People think the word repent means just to be sorry for what you have done. Well, it certainly includes being sorry or saying, I'm sorry. But it's a much deeper word than simply saying, I'm sorry. You know, I have children at home, and children, if you say to them, say you're sorry to your sister, they say, oh, I say, I'm sorry. But you know the way they say it and the way they behave afterwards, they're not sorry at all. They're just sorry they got caught. That's all. Bill Clinton, when he was caught, you remember in the White House, he came on and said, I'm sorry. Well, he's only sorry that he was caught. That's all. He wasn't sorry when he was involved with that other woman. That's not repentance. And one of the reasons we know he wasn't sorry because he continued on that behavior since then. So repentance is far more than simply saying, I'm sorry. What does it mean? Well, literally the word repent is from a Greek word, metanoia, meaning a change of mind. So it's a change of your thinking about a particular sin. In other words, you realize firstly that it is a sin. 
Number two, you realize that it's something that is wrong for you in your life. It's something you're sorry that you did. It's you're something that you don't want to do again. It's something you now hate and you want to turn away. John the Baptist tell, said to the scribes and Pharisees, bring forth meat fruits for repentance. What did he mean by that? He means that repentance involved a changed life, that fruits should follow, a new way of life should follow. So when a person repents, they don't just simply express, I'm sorry. They now hit who they were before. They hit what they did before. They now change their lives. That's part of repentance. They bring forth a new fruit, a new way of life. And if that doesn't happen, there's not true repentance. So the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's writing to this church at Laodicea, he doesn't want the pastor and the elders and the deacons and the members to get up and say, I'm sorry, weep a few tears. Yeah, we're not what we should be. And then go back and live the same way they've been living before. Or change for a short time and then continue on the same way they've been living before. That's not repentance. Repentance means a change of mind and then a change of life. All, all are tied together. So the first thing he says that they should repent, he says, then he says, buy gold. Now he doesn't mean by that you run down to the pawn shop in Clementi or Bukit Batok and buy physical gold. What does he mean by that statement, buy gold? Well, notice here how he describes the gold. Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich. Well, we know that they were materially rich. So he's clearly not talking about material riches, is he? He said before, you think you're rich because you're materially rich, but you're poor, you're destitute. Well, what were they destitute in? Spiritual riches. Now, what is gold tried in the fire. You see in your notes, 1 Peter 1, 7. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Peter speaks of being much more precious, a faith that is much more precious than of gold that perisheth. So what does this gold mean? that's tried in the fire represent. It means a faith that can endure. A faith that it can endure hardship, difficulty, temptations. Where would you get faith like that? Where would you get a faith that can stand up to all kinds of difficulties and problems? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. Faith is not some little, you know, there's not a little petrol station called the faith station. That when you feel low on faith, you come in and pump yourself up with faith and say, okay, I'm full of faith now. I'm ready to go for another week. So where do we get faith from? Romans gives us the answer, doesn't it? Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you want to build up your faith... This is the book that does it. The more you imbibe, take in God's word, the more your faith will be strengthened by this book. The stories of it, the answers to prayer in it, the promises in it. The more you live this out in your life, the stronger your faith will be. That, that's how it works. There's no magical, uh, you know, some people think if you come to church, you get the preacher to lay hands on you and pray over you, you receive faith. No. You receive faith by breathing in God's word. All scripture is in, given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16. The word inspiration means God breathed. This is God's breath. Every word of this. And when you t read the word of God, what are you doing? You're in, imbibing the breath of God. You're breathing in. Every day you eat the bread of God's word. You're feasting on God's word. All these metaphors are used to describe reading God's word. Now, of course, just like in the natural, if you keep breathing in, what's going to happen? Your lungs collapse. 
Christians are not meant to just simply go around all day with their head in the book. You, you go to Israel, you see many of these super Orthodox Jews, don't they? And they're walking the streets and they're going like this. And they won't even look at you when they're in the streets because they say they don't want to waste any moment of their life beyond their basic eating and drinking to stay alive to misreading the Torah. Well, that's a misrepresentation of the Christian life. We are to breathe in in order that we may breathe out. How do we breathe out? By living the Christian life in our home, in our workplace, in our witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you just can't keep witnessing all the time unless you continually breathe in the Word of God. Take it in. It's a balance to the two. We have these... Uh, Groups in the West, not so prevalent here. These cults that go around knocking your door. You, I'm sure you've run into groups like the Jehovah's Witness. Their whole religion is about going out knocking doors. And many of them are, spur are they're emotional and physical wrecks because that's all they do is work, 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 work. They never take time to breathe in. Of course, they don't have the right theology in the first place. No, there has to be a balance. Breathing in and then giving out. Okay? And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to this church at Laodicea, spend some time knowing my word. Spend time meditating upon my word and start living it, those three things. Read it, meditate, live it. Now, no one in the age that we live in has an excuse. Because I'm looking at a congregation that has a lot of education between them. A lot of O levels and A levels and spirit levels and what else. Alan has a spirit level <laughs> for building. If you don't know what a spirit level is, you go and ask him afterwards. We've got a lot of education. We've got internets. We have commentaries. We have sermon audio. We have access to all kinds of tools to help us study God's Word. We have no excuse in our generation. We have it all. So if there's anybody here who says, I don't, I, I find it very hard to study the Bible. I find it very hard to read the Bible. I find it very hard to understand the Bible. You have no excuse. If there's a verse you don't understand, you can Google it. It's so easy for us compared to previous generations. But here's where we often fall down. We read it, but we don't meditate upon it. We read it and we only take out what we want to take out of it and we leave the rest behind. We read it, we even understand it, but then we refuse to follow it. That's often the way of many Christians. And the devil doesn't mind you ultimately reading the Bible as long as you don't obey it doesn't mind. It doesn't mind you reading the Bible ten times a year from cover to cover as long as you don't live it. And this church at Laodicea, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to them, I counsel you, I'm pleading with you, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, you better do this. You better take this gold tried in the fire. And do you know what happens when you study God's word like this? It'll warm your heart up. It'll set you on fire. It will make you a warmer person. You know when you meet some Christians, professing Christians, they're so cold. Have you ever met people like that? They're like ice. And if someone says, oh, it was a good day. Well, oh, it wasn't. You think it is, huh? <laughs> So-and-so spoke really well. Or, oh, no, well, I, I, yes, but I, I thought they said this thing, and I didn't like what they said about this person. And... Uh, you know the type? They can make every molehill into a mountain. They see themselves as snipers for the Lord. They shoot down everybody. <laughs> well, people like that, they don't have a warm heart because the heart is not warmed up by the Word of God. You, you'll never warm that person up by putting them into a furnace. The only way that person can be changed is God's word kindling a fire and a love for others by the word of God. Now, the next thing he says to them, 
you need, not only he says, you need white raiment. Now, why did he say that? Well, if you remember, when we looked at this last week, the city of Laodicea was a place where they, per they made this very expensive cloth because they had this very expensive dye. Now, today we have all these uh, factories all over the world producing cloths, but in the, those days, it wasn't so easy to produce colored cloths. You had to get the dye from various animals, and you had to go and search out certain animals to get particular dyes. And the more difficult it was, the more expensive was the garment. And the Laodicean people had expensive wool from their sheep, their black sheep, and also expensive dyes in their cloth. And they were very proud that they wore things that other cities and other places couldn't wear. So the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, you think you're rich, you, you think you're well clothed, you think you look better than other Christians in other cities. But I want to tell you, he says, you're naked. In my eyes, you've got nothing to cover you. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant one of two things, I would think. Number one, he was saying that there was a group of them that were unsaved in that church. There were a lot of tares in the wheat in that church. Because an unsaved person is not clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Remember we talked about that in the worship service. When you become a Christian, God covers you like he puts a garment around you. Christ's garments of righteousness. And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin anymore because he sees Christ's righteousness covering your sin. So a person that needs to be clothed in white raiment certainly could be speaking about unsaved people in that church in Laodicea. Maybe a lot of unsaved people in that church in Laodicea. They were members, but they were not saved. It also could speak to backslidden believers in that church at Laodicea. If you look at your notes, I've given you some examples where we're told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ as Christians. Colossians 3, 12 to 14, for example, you see all of that. And what it means by that is to put on righteousness, put on purity in your life. Put on the life of Christ experientially. Okay? So that's what he means by the gold and the white raiment. The fourth thing he tells them. He says, anoint thine eyes. Anoint thine eyes. Now, remember in the city of Laodicea, they produced this famous medicine, eye medicine, that cured certain types of blindness or certain types of ailments that would hinder your eyesight. And they sold that all over the Roman Empire. They were famous for this. So the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, you get ointment for your eyes. Now, he's clearly not speaking about their physical eyes, is he? Because they, can, they couldn't read the letter if they physically couldn't see. What's he speaking about? He's speaking about an opening to their spiritual blindness. Spiritual short-sightedness that they had. Now, what opens the eyes of a person? What illuminates the Christian? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity that opens the eyes of sinners to the gospel. Is the person that opens the eyes of saints to the word of God. He guides us. If you go to John's gospel, let's, go to, let's just see this. John's gospel. Chapter 16. And he says that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He says, verse 7, It is expedient for you that I go away. For I go, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. For if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, that's the Spirit, Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That word reprove means convict, reveal, show them that they're sinners. Show them that they need salvation. 
Okay? So the Holy Spirit has a role in opening the eyes of unsaved people to their spiritual blindness. They don't see that they're sinners. He has to do that work. But he has another rule, verse 13. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Remember, the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. So when the Holy Spirit works in the life of a Christian, he can guide you to the book that he wrote, the meaning of it. Lead you into the truth of God's word. So when the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, anoint your eyes, what's he saying? He's saying, let the Holy Spirit open your eyes. Admit you need him. Admit that without him you're blind. Admit him that you know nothing. And ask his help to allow you to see again as a church. Now, having made those things, in verse 19, he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This word, repent, is what we call the imperative. I spell that correctly. Yes, the, the imperative mood. I, I've mentioned this before. In English, we don't have the imperative mood. We use the tone of our voice to emphasize a command. If you say to your son, come here, he may think, mm, that's maybe a suggestion. Or I can come when it suits me. Or if it doesn't suit me, I won't come. But if you say, come here, Generally, he has an idea. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. And we use the tone of our voice to emphasize the command. In Greek, they don't have to do that because they have an ending to their verb. It's called the imperative that shows whether it's a command or a suggestion. And when the Lord Jesus Christ says repent here, he uses the imperative to say this is not a suggestion from the head of the church. This is not something that you can decide to do or not do and remain without any judgment. This is something I'm commanding you to do. You must do it. You must obey this. And he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, one thing I must say in passing in verse 19 is the first part. Because he says, as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. We have this weird thing in the world today that sees love as some mushy emotion that allows a parent or allows a leader in the church or allows a government leader in society to say it's not loving to punish people. It's not loving to discipline people. They say, rather than discipline, you should let your child develop his or her own personality, her own personality. You should allow them to express themselves. You, you should not force your opinions upon them. You should not tell them something's right and something's wrong. You should not force your will as a parent upon their will. And they say, if you do that, that's not loving. Well, who defines love? The psychologist? MOE, the universities, young people, or God. The one who defines love is God. And this is what God says about love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The most loving thing a parent can do for their child is to teach them right from wrong. That's the most loving thing. And then you meet some parents and they talk so much nonsense. And I always think, it's interesting that they see this in one area of their life. For example, you, you don't say to your child, when they're two or three years of age, bring them to the edge of the road where the traffic's flowing and saying, it's up to you, I'll let you make your own decision whether you want to run in front of the car or not. I don't want to be unloving and hold you back and limit your choices here. No. Unless you're insane, every parent knows it's not loving to put your child in a dangerous place, is it? Well, surely it's the same morally, isn't it? It's not loving to let your child destroy themselves morally. It's not loving to neglect discipline and 
Who's the greatest example of fatherhood? God. He's the perfect father, isn't he? And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke. I chasten. There's nothing worse, is there, to go to someone's home. And I've had this experience many times. Maybe some have had it in my home. But I hate going into homes and you're sitting there and the child is playing up. Sometimes not a child, it's quite a large child. And, the and they're running wild and they're doing all kinds of nonsense. And the parents are just sitting there talking to you. And then when the child makes more noise, they talk louder to you. And you're saying to yourself, I wish they would just tell them, shut up. In a nice way. Or I wish they would deal with that. And some say, say oh, can, you keep, can you keep quiet? They might say, and the child just continues on. And then they say, oh, I'm sorry about that. No, it's not, it's not loving to not rebuke. And it's not loving to carry, not carry out discipline in the life of a child. Same in the church, by the way. Same in the society. You know, I was reading recently in the newspaper when I was in UK that Singapore was being condemned by the United Nations. Can you believe that? What a bunch of rogues. And they were saying how bad it is in our society and how we have all these terrible things like the death penalty, they said. And we breach all these human rights, so-called. And as I was reading, I was thinking, that, I don't recognize what they're saying here. Because that's not the society that I live in. And they were condemning Singapore. Because our society practices, not perfectly, a measure of discipline in the society. Where if you kill somebody, you lose your life. If you bring drugs in to destroy someone else's life, you lose your life. Where if you commit crimes, you get locked up or you face also the whip for particular horrific crimes. And guess what? Which developed country has the lowest murder rate in the world? You're living in it. Which country has the lowest crime rate in the world? You're living in it of all the developed nations. Why? Because if you follow what Christ says, you have a society that by and large has a discipline in the society. It brings a blessing to that society. That's true love. That's my little stump speech for Singapore, okay? <laughs> I think they should give me citizenship for that, shouldn't they? <laughs> what does this promise? After giving all this advice, this counsel, these commands. He says in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and he will sup with me, and he with me. I will sup with him, and he with me. Now, the Greek here indicates that he's standing at the door for a period of time already. And he's continuing to knock for a period of time. He's knocking continually. So the Lord Jesus Christ has already been trying to get into this church, to help this church. And he's still trying to get in. Still trying to show mercy to them, show grace to them. Isn't it sad that many, many churches, many, many professing Christians, he's doing the same outside at your life. You have shut him out from your life. And he's knocking and saying, let me in. I want to help you. I want to be with you. I want to take care of you. But we won't listen. We just keep him out. Now, I remember reading years ago, the, uh, a number of commentators, and they make all these clever points in verse 20, and they say, this is used as a gospel text especially for children, and they say, the context of this is nothing to do with the gospel. They say this is to do with simply a church that has backslidden, and Christ is trying to get them to recover from their backslidden condition. And they say it's wrong to use this verse in a gospel application. Is that correct? No, it's rubbish. 
because this church at Laodicea had unsaved people in it, tares, as well as backslidden people in the church. And this can equally be applied to unbelievers. The Lord Jesus Christ is standing at the door of your life, knocking and saying, let me in. Let me become king of your life. Let me forgive you your sins. Let me give you eternal life. But you have to open the door to him. And it's the same is true, by the way, for a backslidden person. If you notice, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm knocking the door. He didn't say, I'll knock the door down. What has to happen for him to come in? You've got to open. You've got to open. And as a Christian, if you have wandered from God, and God is knocking at the door of your life and saying, I want to come in again and renew fellowship with you and have a, a deeper relationship with you, God will not force that upon you. Won't force it. I've used an little expression we use in English many times. You can bring the horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink the water. If you don't believe that, you go over to a country that has horses and you try getting them to drink water. And make sure you've got steel armor. <laughs> because the horse will let you know in no uncertain terms if it doesn't want to drink the water. God is knocking at the door of your heart and my heart continually. And he says... I want to have a deeper walk with you. I want to know you more. And you have to open the door and let him in. Have to. And what happens to those who will let him in? Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Someone asked me earlier, will the saints of God, will we reign on thrones? when we die and go to heaven? Well, we'll answer that question next week when we come to Revelation 4. We certainly will reign on this earth in the millennium. If you remember the thousand years? The saints of God will reign on this earth. Now, I don't know how that works itself out. Don't come up to me after and say, will we be, have a throne in Jerusalem? And how, all these Christians, where, where are they going to be situated? Do we all get a patch of earth to reign over? I don't know. God doesn't tell us all the detail. He just says, you will reign with me. Okay? You, will, you are joint heir with Christ. You will reign with him. And all the sins of God. Now, why does he say it this way? To him that overcometh will I grant. Why doesn't he just say this? To him who is saved, I will grant. Well, the answer is simple. To be saved is to be an overcomer. Remember the five points of Calvinism? You have your tulip. And the fifth one means what? Perseverance of the saints. I've said this before many times. I don't like the term, once saved, always saved. Not because it's untrue, but because it can be misinterpreted. There are people who tell others, just say the prayer, once saved, always saved. And the person prays this prayer and they say, okay, you're going to heaven. Now, the person may not have understood Christianity properly, may not have understood what it means to really surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, make him king and head of your life, what it means to take up your cross daily, surrender all and follow him, what it means to be truly born again. And they have been, may have been sold some type of cheap grace that never truly saved, never truly repented. So when you use terms like once saved, always saved, it kind of cheapens the doctrine. The doctrine is the perseverance of God's true elect. And what does that mean? It means that if you're truly saved, you truly will produce good fruits. You truly will persevere on because the Holy Spirit lives in you and will work in you. You understand the difference? You see the distinction? So... When the Lord Jesus Christ says, to him that overcometh, he's talking about the one who is truly saved, the perseverer. The one who continues on until the very end. How do you and I know that a person is saved on earth? When we look at other people, we don't really. The only thing that we can judge is, do they persevere on? That's all. If they're truly saved, they will persevere on. 
because they're a new creature in Christ Jesus. They're united to Christ in his family. And once you're united to him, he doesn't divorce his children. I mean, even in the physical world that we live in, we understand that concept. Fathers don't say to their children, come here, you didn't do well in your exams, now I'm divorcing you. You're no longer my son, and here's the document to prove it. Bye-bye. Can you do that in Singapore? You can say it, but can you legally do it? No, you can't. A father cannot legally divorce his children. Now, your heavenly father, who's far more just than your earthly father, he doesn't do divorce. What does he say? Yea, I have loved them with an everlasting love. Unconditional, everlasting love. So the overcomer is another way of saying a Christian, a true child of God, someone who perseveres on in good works because they, have a new, they are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's an overcomer. And that's the one who will make it all the way home to heaven. Now let's wrap this up. This letter to the church at Laodicea. is a letter that emphasizes a number of things, doesn't it? But it strikes me it particularly emphasizes this point. It emphasizes the danger of spiritual delusion. How you can think you are something when you're not. Remember this church at Laodicea? They thought they were a good church. They thought they were a very spiritual church. They thought that they were a church that God was very happy with. They said, I have need of nothing. I, 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 I don't need to hear anything bad said about me because I think I'm pretty good. Let me show you something. Go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. It's the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, which takes about three chapters. Matthew, chapter 7. And verse 21. And the Lord Jesus Christ says this, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Now notice he used the term twice, Lord, Lord. So these, these are people who really think that they have a very close relationship. Lord, Lord. Not just Lord, you're my Lord. Lord. Shall enter the king to the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... Now, again, he's not saying there salvation by works. He's saying those are the ones who prove that they belong to me because they do my will. They're the perseverers. They're, they're the ones who've been truly changed by the gospel. But notice what he says in verse 22. Many will say to me. Now, he could have put it this way. Some will say to me. We would say, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand that. There's always a few hypocrites in the church. There's always a few people who, who protect fake Christianity. But Lord Jesus Christ puts it this way, many, many, not, not just a few, not even some, many will say to me, when? In that day. What's the day? The day of judgment. So these are people who are the many who are not outside the church, who are from within the church. Do you see that? They say he's their Lord. Lord, Lord. They're within what's called Christendom. What's Christendom? Everything that calls itself Christian. That includes the Roman Catholic Church, the cults, evangelical Protestants, charismatics, everything that calls itself Christianity. That's called Christendom. Okay? And he's speaking to that whole group of people who claim to be, or claim to believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord. And they say, Lord, Lord. And he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we, have we not used your name to preach? Have we not talked about you? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. In other words, they say, we've even done signs and wonders. We, we claim to have healed the sick and raised the dead and healed people who are blind. We, 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 we make these claims that we did it in your name. Now, Notice what verse 23 says. The Lord Jesus Christ, notice what he doesn't say as much as what he does say, because the two things are just as important. 
He doesn't say to them, no, 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 you weren't in my church in a nominal sense. They were there calling themselves Christians in the church, in Christendom. He doesn't say to them, you didn't do wonderful works. They may well have. Because the devil also can do signs and wonders. The Antichrist will be empowered by the devil himself to do signs and wonders. Please do not fall into the trap of thinking that all these people who claim to do signs and wonders in modern Christianity are doing fake miracles. Some of them may not be fake miracles. Because the Antichrist will do real miracles. And the Antichrist will be empowered by the devil to do fake miracles. You remember when Job lost his children? How, how, did his, how were his children killed? Fire came down. Do you remember? The devil can do things like this. Don't underestimate his powers. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't deny that they had power. Doesn't deny that they even did things in his name. Well, what does he deny? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. So, he's not saying that they were Christians who had suddenly stopped being Christians. What's he saying? They were never Christians. They never had a relationship. They were never born again. They never repented. So, don't assume in Christianity that everybody's a Christian. Who says they're a Christian? Many will claim to be Christians who are not. That's not my words. That's Jesus Christ's words. That's not my interpretation. That's his clear interpretation of future events in the church that calls itself a Christian church. So, now, now I just want to say one other thing about this, Matthew 7. I must say this. You notice when they realize for the first time that they're not Christians? When does it come dawn on them? On the day of judgment. In other words, they've been living all their lives, going along to all these churches, being no doubt affirmed by other people around them. You're a Christian. You live your life that way, but you're still a Christian. doesn't matter. God, God, God doesn't care. God still loves you. You said a little prayer, therefore you're free to live any way you want. No, no. The Lord Jesus Christ says, depart from me, I never knew you. And he adds this in Matthew 7. Ye that work iniquity. In other words, your life demonstrates that you are never a true child of mine. You are a worker of iniquity. Oh yes, you said, Lord, Lord. Oh yes, you claim to do all these miracles in my name. Oh yes, you prophesied in my name. You may have even stood in pulpits in my name. But he says, I, depart from me, I never knew you. You're not my child. You never were my child. And you're going to be lost forever. And these people didn't realize until the day of judgment that they were lost. In other words, they were blind, weren't they? They were like these people in Laodicea that thought they were rich when they were destitute spiritually. Who thought they had sight when they were blind spiritually. Who thought they were beautifully clothed because they wore designer clothes, but spiritually they were covered in filthy rags. What a warning that is. To you and to I. Yesterday in our Bible class in my home, we were studying the life of Noah. We started a new series on Genesis 5 from that series, The Life of Noah. And we looked at a man called Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech, and then Noah. And we saw that each of those generations, in fact, let's turn to it because we have a little bit of time and then we'll stop. Genesis 5. Because if I say it to you and don't show it to you, you might not see it as well. Genesis 5. It says in verse 21, Enoch lived... Sixty and five years begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God and he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat, notice the next three words, sons and daughters. Do you see that? Not son and a daughter, sons and daughters, plural. Now remember, these people are living three, four hundred years. Some of them nine, 900, 950, 960 odd years. These people were probably having 80, 90 children. 
It's not a, it's not a far right assumption to assume. So Enoch has huge numbers of children. Methuselah, verse 26, after he begat Lamech, lived another 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters, plural. <coughs> Lamech begat a son, Noah. And then in verse 30, and Lamech begat sons and daughters, plural. Now bearing in mind that the people were living almost a thousand years at this time on the earth before the flood. <coughs> It's a safe assumption to make that most of those generations mentioned there, at least their descendants were alive when the flood came. Could have been hundreds of thousands of people represented in those, just that generation from Enoch to Noah. Because if they all had a hundred children, if Enoch had a hundred, they had a hundred, you just start to multiply the maths, and those four or five generations is going to be a huge number. But how many of them made onto the ark? Just eight persons. And Noah and his three sons were the only ones that we know definitely were descended from Enoch. Noah's wife could have been from another family. Noah's sons' wives probably were from another family. So out of all those hundreds, indeed maybe thousands of children that came from the godly Enoch, descended down through that little time frame up to Noah, only a tiny, tiny fraction made it onto the ark. That means that almost all the relatives of Enoch were ungodly. Wow. Wow. One of the greatest men in the, that's ever walked on this earth produced some of the most ungodly descendants. There's a warning, isn't there? Spirituality does not pass in the DNA. Sin passes, but not grace. Through the DNA. Don't assume, don't presume that because a person goes to church, comes even from a Christian family, that... They'll make it to heaven. That's the warning of the church of Laodicea as well. My final warning would be this. Can you go to Laodicea today and visit it? Is there a Laodicea Baptist church today? Is there a Laodicea Presbyterian church today? Is there a Laodicea Methodist church today? Is there even a Laodicea Charismatic church today? You know how many Christians live in Laodicea today? Zero. Evidently, they didn't listen to the message. Because Christianity doesn't exist there anymore. Other religions exist in that area. But not Christianity. They didn't listen. When Christ said, be zealous, repent, deal with your sin. They evidently didn't listen. And now today, there's no Christians in the city of Laodicea. There's no church in the city of Laodicea. There's not even a Roman Catholic church. There's not even a monastery. There's not even, even any life of a Christian there who would call themselves a Christian there or even name the name Christian there. It's a spiritual wasteland, Laodicea today. There's a warning in that too, isn't there? So next week, we'll come back. We'll start Revelation chapter 4 and we'll look at the future. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank Thee for Thy Word. We heed the warning, but we also, Lord, heed the counsel. We thank Thee that You not only condemn this church, but You give them a, a door to escape the judgment of God. We pray for all of us that have an ear that we will hear this story of this church at Laodicea. That living in the wealth of Singapore, the prosperity and relative security of Singapore, may we not trust in our own strength. May we not trust in material riches. We are very thankful that 
the crime rate is relatively low in this country, but Lord, may we never simply trust in those things. But may we look for that gold that's tried in the fire. May we always want to be clothed more in the pure garments of Christ. May we always seek to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives to illuminate us, to guide us, to direct us, to reprove us when we do wrong and to lead us into the right direction. May that not just be a prayer, but may that be the desire of our hearts. Do that in our homes. Do that in our workplace. Do that in our church. And do it in our individual lives. For we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.